Welcome to episode 22. Can you believe it? Now this is going to be part two with the one and only I Soon Cook. Some of you may remember that she appeared in episode 14 and it was so popular, we promised we would bring you more. Give us more, give us more. That's what everyone said. So you are going to want to circle back to episode 14 after you listen to this episode because I know you're going to fall in love with Isoon. She has way too much knowledge to try to fit it into one episode. And in fact, I'm pretty sure you guys are going to ask for more Isoon after this episode as well. I'm really happy to have her back, and we just celebrated 15 years together. Uh, And uh, if you listened to episode 14, you heard the story of the time she came to me and tried to quit, and I refused to accept her resignation, and uh, we figured everything out, and uh, I think we've been uh, happy as can be for these 15 years, and I think she would agree, too. She's pretty special. Um, I've got a couple of quick housekeeping announcements I'm going to make before we jump right into the episode. The first one has to do with a live appearance. I will be speaking for ASID in Orlando on September 23rd. So if you're in the Orlando area and you can make it, uh, please reach out to us uh, and we'll make sure that you find out how to attend. And we can't thank you enough when you show up to our events. I really appreciate it. It's so fun to put faces to the names that I see all the time on the site. So love, love, love it. Thank you so much. I want to say also thank you. We got a lovely note from Adam Skugel. You may remember that Adam was on episode 16, and he's a recent convert to Business of Design, so there was a little bit of love going on both sides of the aisle as we talked. But Adam reached out and said, I wanted to share some positive feedback post my interview on the podcast. I have had numerous emails and people reach out to me based on the interview. Many are from colleagues that have also felt lost and I believe have just discovered BOD. And thank you, Adam. We appreciate it. We're definitely seeing an uptick in our Australian membership, which is so great. Also, he writes that he just read a lovely message from a local Sydney designer who also relates to my situation, aiming with strong hope for that time when the passion for design can become a full-time career proposition. And I think it's so sweet that he took time to say, hey, it, it really helped my business. And this is just kind of a gentle nudge to you. If you're listening and you've got expertise that you think can really help the community, we'd love to interview you. Uh, We don't have all the experts tied up, that's for sure. And I've got Veronica Solomon coming back, which we're really excited about. And uh, we're trying to do a nice mix between outside professions, lawyers and brand managers and things like that, and then inside professionals, interior designers uh, like me and like you. So reach out if you'd like to be a guest. We'd love to have you. And now back to the show. Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden. Brought to you by Business of Design, a coaching community for independent designers like you. We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. One of the things that came up in the first part of our interview was what it takes to be that person that answers the phone. And I soon suggestion was to go to drama school and find someone with a big personality to answer your phone. And I thought that was a really fun idea. You can tell by listening to I soon that she has that big personality and in fact has some dramatic training. But she also comes from a corporate background. In her former career, she worked in conflict resolution and HR at the Toronto Star. So she was familiar with media. She's familiar with managing relationships. She knows how to move conversations towards solution. And quite honestly, she has a natural ability to sell things. That is a gift she has, no doubt about it. We always say if you wanted to sell ice to an Eskimo, I assume would be the person that you would get on the phone. So people have a hard time saying no to her because her enthusiasm is so infectious and I love her to death. So if you're thinking about making this hire, if you're thinking about hiring someone to answer your phone, which I strongly, strongly recommend you do, uh, then you are going to want someone who is very comfortable talking about money, is very comfortable with sales 
and who can really follow the script that you're going to give them. Now, Isoon's going to talk about her script today. She's going to talk about budgeting. How do you get a number out of the clients? Because we all know that's so hard to do. And she's going to talk about uh, her eight module learning system for creating a, a procedure for closing the sale that you can use and your staff can use as well. For those of you on the fence and you think, you know, you're pretty good at answering the phone, I totally get that. Um, I was not, as I said in the first podcast, uh, I would phone clients back in the middle of a job site and be distracted or while I was at Starbucks placing my order for a cappuccino and I had to put them on mute and then I missed what they were saying. And quite honestly, that is not a good first impression when that customer is phoning you because their project, big or small, is the most important thing in the world to them at that moment. So having a person who's sitting in an office where it's quiet and controlled, phone them back in a timely manner. I don't even think we ended up talking about that, but our policy is they get a return phone call within 24 hours of a business day. If it's Saturday or Sunday, our website, our voicemail, everything lets people know that we're closed on Saturday and Sunday. But if it's a weekday, they get that return call very quickly. And I'll be honest, there were lots of times when I was so busy, I wasn't phoning them back as quickly as I needed to. The other aspect of what I soon does for me, though, is equally important. And if you're thinking of a hire, if it's a person who can do uh, this other side of things as well, it's really going to be helpful to you. And that is this. She really is a gatekeeper who manages my schedule and makes sure that when someone approaches me to attend an event or appear at an event, that I'm either paid for that gig or um, there is compensation in another form. And it's much easier for her to speak to that than it would be for me to speak to that. So for example, I am frequently asked to make appearances at home shows. And uh, you know, in 1995, 96, 97, boy, we got paid a lot of money to make those appearances at the home shows. And today it's very different. The first thing uh, usually the uh, producer of the show will say, it's a great opportunity for you. And when I hear the words great opportunity, I know they're going to ask me to do something for free. So you can go broke on great opportunity everybody. So I soon will phone them back, show respectfully here what the request is, and then she will ask for money. And many years ago, we decided that $500 uh, was free, that if somebody wanted me to do something for free, the minimum we could afford to do it for was $500. Because often it means getting your hair done, getting your nails done, getting something dry cleaned, uh, uh, parking, all those kinds of things add up. So free is $500. $500. And I soon is the person who can deliver that message much better than I can, by the way. But if you are strong on the phone, if you are comfortable with sales, if you heard episode one with Veronica Solomon, you know she falls into that category. She can definitely answer her own phone. Uh, if that's something you think you're good at, then at least what you're going to learn today from I soon are some tips on how to manage that phone call, how to close the sale, how to get a budget out of a customer, and a whole lot more. Before we jump into the episode, I do want to say thank you to our newest sponsor, and I'm very, very grateful to this particular sponsor, Kravit Fabrics, Kravit Inc. I have been a loyal customer of Kravit Fabrics since 1991, and that's not because I'm a nice person. That's because they deliver unparalleled customer service. What do I mean by that? Of course, they sell me beautiful fabrics and beautiful wall coverings and now carpets and curated cravat as well, furniture. But what I love about them, in addition to the fantastic products they provide, which make me look good in front of my clients, is their customer service. When I have an issue, when I have a question, they are immediately responsive to my needs. They understand what it is that I do and they immediately satisfy me so I can in turn satisfy my clients. 
established in 1918. They are still a family-run business, which I love, and they remain industry leaders supporting the community. So thank you so much to Kravit for reaching out and sponsoring the podcast. And for those of you who aren't shopping at Kravit, I really encourage you to support them as they really do care about the trade and your trade business. And to be perfectly frank and even crass, you can make a lot of money when you sell fabrics to clients. So it's a win-win. Thank you, Kravit, Inc. Back by popular demand, I soon I knew we'd have too much to talk about to contain it within one podcast episode. So this is part two of our episode, um, Closing the Sale uh, with Isoon. And thank you again for being here. I'm delighted to be back. <laughs> you are so much fun. And we ended up spending quite a bit of time in the first podcast talking about um, putting a smile on your voice when you phone people back, having a firm goal when you phone them back of selling that consultation, not selling them the entire project, but just selling them that consultation. And um, also talking about your fabulous follow-up uh, and how that was really difficult for me making a follow-up call. I felt that if I was such a good designer and I was so busy, why should I be chasing people to hire me uh, where you don't have any of those issues um, and that you're really great with sales. And so one of the things that we didn't get a chance to talk about and we need to talk about is that darn budget. All of us yeah. struggle with how to get the client to give us a budget. So typically what happens, I assume they phone you and what do you, what are, what do you ask them in that regard? Uh, quite often I'll ask them what the scope of the project is. Some people will phone and it's just one room that they're uh, doing. So they need a refresh, a refresher. And you know that that's not necessarily going to be one of the largest projects, but I'll give you an example of something recently Someone phoned, and they, as I asked them questions about the project, the scope of the project, was it, was there going to be any renovation? Yes, there was. There was a, um, a, a wall, perhaps two walls that were going to be taken down, a uh, kitchen, and two bathrooms. Now, right away, I'm thinking, I wonder if this client knows that kitchens and bathrooms are the most expensive things that you can fix in your home. So I asked her right away, I said, uh, <laughs> You realize, of course, that kitchens and bathrooms are the most expensive. Did you have a budget in mind? And she was delightful. She right away said, yes, as a matter of fact, I do have a budget in mind. It's $750,000. And I'm thinking, this is our client. This is fantastic. Now, on the other hand, sometimes you'll talk to someone and they want a complete kitchen renovation. And you'll ask, did you have a budget in mind? And they say, yes, uh, about $20,000. Now I have to start talking to them about that might not be realistic there might, you'll have to be, uh, be a little bit more flexible. Wait until the designer gets there because she's the expert in her field. But is, do you have any flexibility in that? If they don't, honestly, they're not our client. Um, right. I remember one time years ago with one of our senior designers went exactly, and they had $35,000 for the kitchen. And he was honest. He said, you're not going to get your new appliances. You're not going to get this, this, and this. Let's see which things on the wish list do you need done right now. I mean, we can certainly work with what we can do for that, but we're not magicians. We can't pull a rabbit out of a hat, and we're not going to be disrespectful and lie to the client just to get our foot in the door for them to be angry and disillusioned later to find out that their $35,000 kitchen is now going to cost $250,000. So we sort of have to nip that in the bud with the phone call. I'm not going to talk to them about the whole design project. That's not my bailiwick. I don't have a background in interior design, but I do know after 15 years in the business, what is realistic and what is not. Wow. That, that is, that's such good information that you right away get them to talk about it. Now, what do you do with the client who says, um, uh, budget? Oh, pff, I don't know. What, what do you do then? Well, I have on occasion turned on and said, well, do you have a million dollars to spend or do you have $10,000 to spend just to get them talking. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll say, well, I don't have a million dollars to spend. Sometimes we laugh about it. Sometimes they get indignant. Uh, but at least we start, that sometimes will open the door uh, to start talking about money. Right. And I know that there is some flexibility. 
I know that there are always going to be deficiencies. I also know that if a client phones and says that they have a $100,000 budget, and I say to them, now, did you know that when we start the project, uh, of course, I explained a little bit. I don't go into a lot of detail because you do that or the designer does that rather when they go through the contract about uh, sharing design trade-only discounts. But what I will say is with your $100,000 budget, did you realize that approximately 20% is going to go to design fees, to the designer's professional fees? Now you've got $80,000. Can you think you can still get your project done for eighty? dollars now that gets them thinking. Now they're thinking, oh, maybe I have to stretch my budget to $125,000 mm-hmm. to accommodate for the designer's expert fees. Those are professional fees, and they, a lot of times people who have not worked with a professional designer before don't even take that into account. Well, that's great. They need to, of course, be aware that they're going to be design fees. And yes, of course, I do talk to them about that. But sometimes I assume, don't you find too, that they don't want to tell you the budget because they're afraid if they tell you the budget's 300000 that uh, I'm going to spend 600000 or um, they've had a bad experience previously with another designer or design professional who didn't tell them the truth about what it was going to cost. Yes, there, there are actually two types of people. There, there's the type that they're afraid that if they say the budget's 300 that the designer will try to sell them a $600,000 project. Then there are the people that only have 10000 because at, not only that they have $10,000 that they've saved up for a, um, to redo their living room, and they're, they're fearful that that's not enough, that's too small a project. So I speak to both of them by saying every project is important because it's your home. And if somebody has had um, an unfortunate or a negative experience with the designer before, then I just encourage them to thank goodness you phoned us here because we're going to do it right. We're going to make you so happy. This is your home. You're going to be delighted. Right. You know what? I'm glad you brought that up because we do not have a minimum amount of money that we will take a project on for. If they only have $10,000 and they just want to refresh the living room, that can be a really fun project that happens really fast. And uh, we like that. We like the instant gratification of something like that. Or if they're doing a million and a half dollar addition, uh, that's fun too. And that's going to be a year and a half. So we like that variety. But what I think you're telling me you're looking for is that the client has at least a, um, a realistic vision of what the amount of money that they want to spend will buy. The client needs to have a realistic vision. The client also needs the reassurance and the confidence that they're in the right hands, that they're phoning somebody that cares about their satisfaction, their well-being, their happiness in their home, and not just about the budget or the money that's going to be made or let's sell them the $20,000 sofa instead of the $5,000 sofa. I think that a lot of times the person that initial consultation call or the initial sales call is to introduce the client to the care and the integrity of the design firm. That's how I feel. Wow. And integrity is really big in our company, and it's especially important to the two of us. We talk about it a lot. It matters to us. And there's a lot of um, people in our industry that are out of integrity, and sometimes that person who's called has run into uh, a situation that uh, where that design professional was out of integrity. And being able to talk about that candidly, transparently, is very assuring to clients, isn't it? It's very reassuring. And by the end of a conversation, you can tell when they, they are able... Sometimes if I introduce budget too early, I can tell that I've done that. I need to get the client's confidence. I need to talk about how we work, ask them about the project. If I introduce budget toward the end of the conversation, many times they're more willing to start to talk to me because now we're friends. Now we're compatriots. Now we're, you know, talking about design over the phone and, oh. and it gets them very excited and, and, um, you can tell that they start to get their guard down, those people that have not worked with a design professional before. I never thought of that before. I just assumed you've got your checklist and time to ask about budget, so I'm going to ask about budget. But you're, you're actually developing a relationship with them, and then you introduce the topic of budget, not because you're trying to trick them into spending more money, but rather you're trying them 
to get them to be comfortable enough to talk about it honestly. That's correct. And also, because it is a business, I need to know what we're dealing with. You know, it is care, it is integrity, and it is gaining their confidence. But at the end of the day, we are also professionals. And I want to know what I'm now going to go back to the designer because there's a very specific, uh, I know we'll get to this later, but there's a very specific consultation form that I fill out with these types of insights that I've discovered after speaking to somebody on the phone for 20 or 30 minutes. Here's the other thing I really want to emphasize, because I assume we'll give me a consultation form, which we're definitely going to talk about. And it will say on the consultation form, they want to renovate their kitchen, the budget's $100,000. Designers, if you're listening, that's not the budget. Don't for a minute think you're obligated to perform the work that they want you to perform for that number. Very often when I go to the consultation and I've explained to them that I see that what you hope to spend is $100,000, I acknowledge that. I let them know that the way we work is we price everything. And at step five, we bring them their wish list all priced. And I let them know that in all of my years, 25 years now working in the business, it's never happened once that the cost of the wish list is less than the hoped for budget. It's always the opposite. So the client may hope to spend $100,000, but by the time you've priced the Wolf Range and the Sub-Zero Fridge and the industrial dishwashers, et cetera, et cetera, the price of the kitchen is now at $150,000, and the client then has got to make some firm decisions. So the point I want to make is just because uh, they've told you a budget on the phone, that's not a contractual obligation for you to perform services for that amount of money. It's just a starting point, really, right, I soon? It's absolutely a starting point, and I always let the client know that, too. I always ask them, what do you envision? What Have you thought of a budget? And if they said, we thought around $100,000, I say, great, I'm going to make sure that that's put into your client file. And that's why when you show up on set, you say, I see you've discussed with Isoon that it's $100,000. But, again, if they want top-end appliances or if they want the more expensive sofa because it's absolutely their dream sofa, there's always a contingency built into any, um, into any project, into any budget. And I think we used to, Kimberly, we used to say contingency could be up to 30%, even more. Oh, my gosh. You, you, you referenced a consultation I went on recently where the budget was $750,000. I did the presentation about a month ago, and the budget they wanted to spend to renovate their property, um, including everything, was $750,000, which is a lot of money. I mean, there's nobody listening who's thinking, oh, that's chump change, I don't think. We all think that's a lot of money. So I did my presentation, which was just the interior. We did the design of the renovation and the build. So we have all the design, the electrical, the reflected seating plans, all of it is totally designed, but we only priced what we provide uh, or what we procure uh, in terms of the interior. And that price came to $900,000. That did not mm-hmm. include building the renovation. And the clients, I was nervous because I thought they want to spend $750,000. Uh, and I've priced just the inner workings of the whole house. Uh, and the renovation, and it's uh, $900,000, what are they going to say? And what they said is, this is this is fabulous. I mean, I wish it were less money, but this is fabulous. Let's get a builder, and let's get a price on the renovation, and uh, we're moving forward. So I can't, you said it previously, we're not magicians. We live in the real world. We price things in the real world. So that budget conversation is important because you're getting to know whether or not the person who's inquiring about your services is realistic in any way about what it's going to cost, really, is the point. Yes, and they want it done right. At the end of the day, when they've made that commitment, when they've signed the contract, when they've given us a retainer check, and they're ready to move forward, I believe that most clients have a floating contingency in their head, and they want it done right. So the $750,000 client is now a nine hundred or maybe a $1 million client, but at the end of the day, they'll say, this is gorgeous, I am so happy, 
and it was done right. Yeah. Now this client's going to be over a million and a half because by the time we price building it, it's I'm assuming that's going to be a you know another seven hundred and fifty or whatever, and they were fine yep. with it. So again, it just proves to me over and over again that you know it's very difficult for clients to talk about money. Um, they yep. either don't know what it's going to cost, or they're afraid to tell you the actual budget that they have. But if I stick to the principles uh, that I've outlined uh, through the fifteen steps, and I price everything at step four, and I show them what we've priced at step five, invariably the client says, line by line, this looks very reasonable. But but when you add it all up, of course, it's always more expensive than they than they want to spend. But that's an important phone call to have, a conversation rather, to have at the beginning. And it's also um, worthwhile to note that it's better for someone else to have that conversation at the beginning because then the client can't say, you promised me $100,000. Uh, I'm not even the person that spoke to them on the phone. It was I soon. Um, so that's kind of another, it puts you one step away from that initial talk about the budget as well, doesn't it? Yes. And you just, uh, you just made me think of a couple of other, uh, items to, to bring up. Number one is the client that wants reassurance that they're going to be advised and they're going to give approval every step of the way. Because sometimes when I bring up budget and they'll say, I have $150,000, then Often the follow-up question will be, but I mean, I'm going to I'm going to be able to approve everything that they buy, and that's when I explain we have a 15-step process. You absolutely will know what we're buying. You're going to be signing off on things. There's we need client approval to move forward. That makes them sigh, breathe a sigh of relief. The other thing too, Kimberly, that we should bring up is those people that phone and ask for a free consultation or that the consultation, if I pay the $800 for the consultation, will that be removed from my bill if I sign for a project? Yeah, that's a thing. Some designers do that. They charge the initial consultation fee and then they take it off the next bill. What We've never even talked about that. We don't do that. I don't like it. I don't agree with returning the, um, the consultation fee if they sign up for a project, not at all. That is two hours that you've gone on site, you're giving your expert advice, you're giving your time, your energy, that's time that you should be built for. And uh, so if they're moving forward with the project, that will start with the contract and with new billable hours. So um, I guess each person can make their own decision on how they want to run the business, but I believe that you should get paid a fair rate for uh, work done. Yeah, I like that too. Okay, now let's talk about your script because I know budget is part of it, but what else is in that incredible top secret script of yours? <laughs> top secret script, yes. Top secret. Is it just the two of us talking, Kimberly? Only you and I. One of the most important things when I am following the script is to ask the client how they heard about us. Yeah. That's really important because you want to find out if your advertising dollars are being spent wisely. For example, I think you, uh, we remember that when we had the, um, the new signage put up on the building, we had about 40% of the inquiries calling in were because they saw our wonderful sign. Yeah. That was fantastic. That shocked me. Yeah. And conversely, do you remember when we did some advertising uh, with House and we were all excited about it because so many designers said they got so many leads and so many referrals and you turned around and said, you know, no, not at all. I'm asking everybody how they're hearing about us. That's not one of the things they're mentioning. That's right. And so you have to go with where the success is. So if the success is from, for example... Uh, community newspaper and you're getting a lot of people phoning in from that, that's great. If other uh, designers are having great success from the house advertising, that's terrific. But you have to continue. If it's working, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, basically. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that's that's the best I can, I can figure. So if people are phoning in because they have, for example, seen you on City Line, uh, that's, that's terrific. We know that the appearances on City Line are getting us clients. Getting to how you heard about us can be achieved in a variety of ways. And I know you have some funny techniques for doing that. Some techniques where you kind of plant some good seeds while you're asking the question. Tell us about some of your tricks. Oh, I love it when a client phones in or a potential client phones in and I say, have you heard about us from one of our satisfied clients? Because we get a lot of repeat 
business from people that loved us with the first project and now they've moved to a larger house and they call us again or perhaps they've bought a vacation home and uh, they phone us again and the thing is we've given them such a a great experience with the first time, of course they're going to call us back again. But I love that. For the person who's not calling us because they got a referral from a great client, what you're saying is, hey, did you know we have amazing clients who refer us all the time? So that's really good information that you're giving them. Yes. And I also have it, if it's an email inquiry, which we get, it's also in the standard email that I send back to them saying, did you know that we have an 85% uh, repeat client success rate. That's so good. Um, I know if I was a person phoning them back too, I might be shy to say something like, did you see me in house and home this month? But you're not shy about that stuff. So you'll say, hey, did you notice Kimberly had a big um, feature about her design work in the newspaper this weekend? A lot of people are calling about that. I'm never shy about that. I'll ask if they've seen you in the magazine. I'll ask if they saw you on TV. I'll ask if they heard about the fabulous new trip that we're doing with Design Express. It's to let people know that uh, Kimberly Selden Design is, or Kimberly Selden Design and Business of Design isn't just uh, one-dimensional. We do a lot of different things. I also like to let the designer know, I'd like to let you know, especially if there's been somebody that you've met, let's say you met them back in 2003 with one of our Design Express trips. And you meet hundreds, if not thousands, of people every year. You're not necessarily going to remember that. But they remember it fondly, and they may say, oh, I phoned in because I remember Kimberly from the trip we took to Montreal or the trip we took to New York. So I always make sure I give that information to the designer on the consultation form. So it's one more piece, one more sort of intimate piece that they can um, introduce when they first meet the client. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's so good. So part of what you do is analyze the phone calls that come in so you can direct us in terms of our advertising, in terms of what I'm talking about on television, et cetera. What else do you do to analyze and evaluate the business? One of the wonderful tools that I use, and I like to pass it along to any of my coaching clients as well to start using in their business, is something called a lead form. Now, a lead form really is nothing much more than a running list, like an Excel sheet would work or um, some sort of a chart, but it has the person's name, a brief, just brief information about what their project is about. Is it a design build? Is it a reno? Is it a freshening up of a room, just to sort of gauge whether it's going to be a long-term or short-term project, and then how they heard about us. And then pertinent information like email and phone number. Now, the reason I do that is because if I do uh, complete the sale upon the first phone call, then I get to highlight in yellow, and that's a fantastic, happy, happy color for me. But some people aren't able or available to sign up right away with the first phone call. So I make sure that I say, spoke to them April 8th, follow up April 12th, for example. And then I'll follow up, and most of the time they're so um, excited to hear the follow-up because they've just forgotten. It's just so many things happen. Um, You know, life goes on. They have their kids. They have their business. They've got all sorts of things happening. So when I phone and say, oh, hi, it's like, did you want to go ahead and book that design consultation? They're joyous. They say, yes, I do. I forgot about it. Let's do it now. Well, what I'll do is I'll highlight in blue, knowing that I was going to follow up, and then when we do follow up, booked design consultation for May 15th, highlight in yellow. I keep a running tab of all of the phone calls that I make during the month. And at the end of the month, I get to send it to the designer so that they can see how we're doing, where our advertising is going to, how did they hear about us, and how many consultations were closed and sold. And uh, they can also keep those lists, those forms, to see how many of those consultations then turned into design clients. I love that. That's so good. And oftentimes when you're the sole proprietor working by yourself, you just don't have time to track all this important information. And the other thing is we can go back year over year and we can see consistently in October, we 
typically get 42 phone calls and it typically turns into eight new projects. And so we know October's a big month. Um, and so this October, let's say things are slow. You can reach out to me ahead of time and say, I'm not sure what's going on, but things are slow. Can you step up your TV appearances? Would you like me to call some past clients? It really allows us to more effectively keep clients in the pipeline as well. So it's really good stuff that you keep track of. Exactly. And the reason I call it fabulous follow-up, because this lead form is the fabulous follow-up, is to put a um, put to put a positive spin on it. A lot of people don't like to follow up. They feel like they're bugging the client. They feel like, oh my gosh, how many times do I phone until they finally say, enough already? Well, it doesn't happen to me that way. I always make sure that there's at least 48 to 72 hours before I follow up. And then I've even joked around, too. I've even phoned and said, hi there, it's Isoon. Just wondering if you want to move forward with booking the design consultation. I know there's a really fine line between following up and bugging somebody. And then they'll laugh and they'll say, no, no, not at all. I'm so happy that you called. And I keep following up until I get either a no or uh, uh, maybe we're going to revisit this in three months, in which case I'll move it to the lead sheet for or the lead form for, you know, September. Yeah. Or we've decided to go in a different direction. I want to hear. I want to hear that there's an end to it. Is this client ours? No, they're not. Because why? They went with someone else. Sometimes the answer is it's too expensive. We don't have it in the budget right now. That's fine. Perhaps they'll come back. Perhaps they won't. But at least I know why we didn't um, book that client. I love that. That is so so good. Let's talk about getting paid. In the old days, I used to show up at their house and I would awkwardly have to ask for the money. We don't do that anymore. So what's the process for getting paid for that consultation? That's correct. We don't do that anymore because the poor designer spent the first 20 minutes waiting for the client to get out their checkbook and sit down and hand the invoice. And it was just, it was a waste of both people's time, both the designer and the client. The client wants that solid one and one and a half to two hours with the designer. So now what we do is uh, when I speak to them on the phone, I let them know that the policy is that once we've booked the date and time in the calendar, we get paid uh, right away. So either by credit card or e-transfer. Um, no one pays by check anymore, so that's not even an option anymore. It might have been 10 years ago. Right. And as soon as it's paid, then that's it. Then it goes into the designer's calendar. They know that if it's in their calendar, that date and time and that segment of time is paid for. And that's a really good thing. The client understands right from the beginning that we have a process for everything, including getting paid for the consultation. We're not messing around if you want to book that time. Now, what do you tell the customer who says, well, I'm not sure, but can you hold that date for me? Can you keep that date uh, blocked off in Kimberly's calendar and, uh, and I'll let you know if I'm going to book it? Sometimes people do, and you know, sometimes they they legitimately do phone back to book it within two days. I tell them that the policy is that I can hold it in the calendar on a soft hold for 48 hours, but after 48 hours, the calendar releases the date, and um, I can find them another date. It's not solidified in the calendar until it's paid in full. I also let them know about what the cancellation policy is, um, because we understand life happens. Sometimes a kid gets sick or... Uh, someone gets called into work when they didn't think that they had to. So if they let us know within 48 hours, I'm happy to reschedule. But if they cancel outright or if they cancel the morning of, we'll refund the money, but there is a $75 processing fee to pay for my time. Right. So we're just really clear about that. What I love about getting paid up front is a million things. But one of the things I love about it is since we adapted that policy more than 10 years ago now, I've never once shown up to the consultation and the client wasn't there. And that used to happen all the time. They forgot about it. Oops, I'm sorry, I forgot. My bad. You know, And I would drive an hour and a half in the snow to get to their house. And uh, they hadn't paid for the consultation yet. So it wasn't a priority. But every single time in the last 10 years when they've paid in advance, when I've shown up at the consultation, they're there and they're ready to work. So I love how professional that is right from the beginning. Absolutely. I remember there was a time you and I were talking by my desk. You were all ready to go. You had your consultation bag. You had your coat on. You had your lipstick on. You looked fabulous. Phone call. Oh, hi, I have to cancel. 
And it, it, and that was before the policy. It has not happened since when they paid for that. Then this, and I have on, in the invoice, there's a specific line that says this date and time have been set aside especially for you. Right. Because that's the thing. They're important. This date and time, ha- time has been set aside especially for you. Kimberly will be there. I always suggest that they write down a list of questions because you want to use your time as efficiently as possible. And there have been times that once the designer leaves, an hour later they think, oh, I should have asked her that, and I receive an email or the inevitable follow-up right. phone call. So that's why part of um, the follow-up, part, part of the confirmation package, and we could do a whole other thing on the confirmation package and following up afterwards, but uh, part of the confirmation package is, Exactly that, setting aside the date and time, letting them know, sending them their invoice that they've already paid, and that's it. All you have to do then is show up and get the work done. Okay, a couple quick things you mentioned there, and that has to do with minimum time versus maximum time. Um, If they don't use the whole two hours, tell us about that, because that's changed for us. That has changed for us, and people have been... It's been interesting, to say the least. Uh, if, if, for example, everything gets explained and uh, you're finished, you know, 10 minutes before the hour, on occasion I've received a phone call saying, well, we finished early. Uh, can I get that 10 minutes refunded? So when I sell the consultation, I let them know that a consultation is up to a maximum of two hours and it is a set fee of $800 for that block of time up to a maximum of two hours. So if everything is decided and figured out in an hour and a half and you take the time to now explain how the, um, how the contract works and how much of a retainer we require for the project, that is still an $800 uh, session. It doesn't happen very often. Most of the time you are there for a full two hours, but, you know, occasionally right. one of two things happens. It's a little bit early, or, Kimberly, remember there have been a couple of times that it's gone over for an extra half an hour or up to three hours. So I follow up with them. I let them know that it is this much per hour, and may I have permission to book the, the credit card for the extra time. If it's 10 or 15 minutes, we can be a little bit flexible. It rarely, rarely happens. But if they keep you there for another 30 to 45 minutes, that's another 30 to 5, 45 minutes of billable time. Right. And we, we had to implement this policy because me, what would happen is if we were done in an hour and 15 minutes, I'd say, oh my gosh, you still have 45 minutes left. I tell you what, uh, why don't we just book another time and I'll come back for 45 minutes? And that created a nightmare situation for us with you phoning them back multiple times to reschedule and then me having to book the calendar again and show up again. And it was not 45 minutes. It was another hour and a half, et cetera, et cetera. So like all good systems, it came out of a real need. You mentioned something else too, which was that... Um, you remember what it was like before we had that system and after. You also remember what it was like before we had the 15 steps and after. And one of the big, big changes of having those 15 steps is we went from having zero repeat and referral clients to 85% repeat and referral clients. That for us was huge. What else did you notice changed when we started developing those 15 steps? The biggest change was that clients weren't phoning to get confirmation and to get clarification. They knew exactly what they were getting. They had the exact 15 steps. They were kept um, informed along the way. They were asked for approval when it was needed. And there was very few sort of that loosey-goosey emails and phone calls about, well, what about this? What about if this happens? Or what about if that happens? They knew what the process was. Everyone was on board. Much more smoother sailing. We are so happy that we have these steps, I can't tell you. I assume, what do you do uh, about uh, booking consultation in terms of the calendar? Um, It doesn't look good to say, yeah, she's available today. She can be there in an hour, right? Everybody should be busy. That's not a good optic. But also, if I'm not available for two months, that can cause a problem. So what's the sweet spot when you're booking a consultation in terms of how many weeks away it is? I would say the sweet spot is between two and five weeks 
people are willing to wait. People are also willing, by the way, if they're phoning specifically for Kimberly Selden, we've had people that are willing to wait for two months, especially those that don't, there's not an urgency to their project. But then there are those people that phone and they want to find out right away, is she available next week? Is she available the week after? I usually try to book within two to three weeks, but it also depends on, uh, uh, you know, how busy we are, how much you're traveling between L.A. and Toronto, how much we are busy with the bigger projects. So I always let them know if there is a three- to six-week waiting period. If that causes an issue, I'll let them know right away. It rarely does. Uh, and the other thing is that once I figure out when they uh, are able to, to book the design consultation, I will email them two or three possible dates and times so that they can sort of say, yeah, this time or that time. Now, if I'm on the phone with them and they want to book right away, I look on the calendar and I say, we can book this right now. But then, again, it would take a credit card and full payment in order to solidify it in the calendar. Perfect. I can't recommend this woman enough uh, or someone like her, but for those of you who would like some sales training, we do offer that actually. Uh, we came about quite organically. We had a business of design conference and I soon you spoke and there was an overwhelming demand to learn what's in your script and what's your process. So tell everybody a little bit about your sales training. I would be delighted to. Well, first of all, yes, I remember with that one business of design conference, I had something like 15 people afterwards glom onto me and say, yes, I want to book the sales and design consultation uh, training. So it was, it was wonderful. And uh, what it is, it's a one-hour telephone session. I can either be one-on-one -on -one with your uh, client services person, or I've also done it where the client sets up a conference call and I'll be able to speak to uh, three or four. I think the maximum I've done is four people in the room and do the uh, telephone training. It's a one-hour session. There are eight learning modules. Um, it's a training session that's going to improve your sales pitch and turn potential clients into paying customers. It's based on a lot of what we've been speaking here, but much, much more depth. Sometimes people, we don't even get through everything in the first hour, and people want to, to book a second hour. But I do, I always hit the, uh, the eight modules, but sometimes people want a sort of a deeper, more uh, detailed session. All you have to do is go on to businessofdesign.com under sales and design consultation training and click on it, and I will get in touch, and I will book it with you. It's $325 U.S. Perfect. And we've had 100% uh, thrilled people who've taken that course and want more from you, I assume. So we got to figure out what other courses you're going to teach and add them to the regular curriculum of businessofdesign.com. You're a wonder, and I love talking to you, and I love having you in my life. And thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to do this for us. Oh, well, thank you. It's been my pleasure, and I love you right back. At Business of Design, we know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate business challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today, and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses, plus access to Kimberly Selden as your mentor and guide. Unlike coaching, which can take years to produce tangible results, BOD is a fast track to immediate results for independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers just like you. Monthly membership is only $67.50. Annual members save two months and have access to Kimberly's contracts. What are you waiting for? Together, we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today.